is Sarah Levere. I am the director here at the Brunswick County Board of Elections. I have been working with the department since 2006 and I've been director since 2014. I am very passionate about what I do. I love working with people. I love educating the public. Um, and I really like making sure that everybody gets the chance to cast their ballot in a free and fair election. So I thought leading up to the primary election that it would be helpful if I spend some time explaining what a primary election is. A lot of people don't understand all of the caveats that go along with the primary election because it's not exactly the same as a general election. Um, before we get into the meat and potatoes that surround um, the primary, I do wanna talk a little bit about who we are, what we do, um, and who oversees us. So we are the Brunswick County Board of Elections. We are the nonpartisan governmental agency tasked with administering elections in Brunswick County. Um, we have a full-time staff of six employees. So I am the director. Uh, we have Melissa Monroe, who is the deputy director. Adrienne Rushton is the assistant deputy director. Butch Johnson is our elections computer technician. Ryan Childress is our election logistics technician. And Kathy Briggs is our registration clerk. And so we are the people that are here year round. Many people think that elections come once or twice a year and that's when we come into play. We actually are working full time um, year round to make sure that elections can happen. During the election season, we do get significantly more busy. And because of that, we do have to bring in temporary staff to support the full time staff to complete all of the tasks that go into making an election happen. Um, so sometimes our staff may double. In the 2020 general election, we were much, much more outnumbered by temps than we've ever been before. So we might have had our full time staff and I think at one point we were up to about 20 temporary employees helping us out. We are overseen by a bipartisan board of elections. So the five member board is made up of Democrats and Republicans and they oversee the functions of our office. Um, we also answer to the State Board of Elections. So the State Board of Elections is the state agency that oversees elections in all 100 counties in North Carolina. So that's a little bit about us. Now, talking specifically about this upcoming election. So you may be aware we all are already into early voting for the primary election. We are on day three today. We have early voting sites open. They started at 10 o'clock this morning. Um, and what people are participating in is a primary election. So what is a primary election? I like to think of a primary election as a nomination process. So we are narrowing down the field of all of the candidates for an office from a single party to get to one candidate who will go on to the general election to face the candidates for that office of other parties. So for example, if the office of dog catcher is on the ballot this year, and we have five Republicans file for the office of dog catcher, the primary election is going to serve the purpose of narrowing down those five to one who will be the nominee for the Republican party who will go on to the general election to face the candidates from other parties to actually win that office. Um, so that is what a primary is, it's a nomination process. And what are some of the things you need to know about the primary? So primaries are a little bit different. And the reason for that is because the ballot that you choose depends on the party that you chose when you registered to vote. So voters must vote in the party of their, in the, in the partisan primary of their declared party. So if you are registered as a Republican, you must vote in the Republican primary. If you're a registered Democrat, you must vote in that Democratic primary. So the voter registration deadline for this election has passed. So at this point, if you are registered with um, a party, you have to vote in that party's primary. It's also important to note that in a primary, because it's a nomination process, your ballot only has the candidates from that party. So there are no Democrats and Republicans on a single ballot. Um, Unaffiliated voters 
do have the choice when they go to vote which party's primary they want to participate in. So as an unaffiliated voter, you would go in to vote and you would, you would provide your name, address, and then you would need to choose which party's primary you want to participate in. You can choose for this primary, Democrat or Republican. There is a libertar Libertarian Party recognized in North Carolina, but they did not have more than one candidate file for any office, so they do not have any primary elections um, this year. So libertarian voters actually do not have a ballot option in this primary election. Um, when an unaffiliated voter makes the selection about which party's primary they want to participate in, that does not change their party affiliation. So they are only making a choice of ballot for that primary. They are not actually updating anything um, on their registration. So that does not change. And then lastly, I think it's important for young people to know that if they are going to be 18 by the date of the general election, so this year that is on November 8th, a 17 year old can participate in the primary because in the primary, again, we are nominating a candidate to go on to the general election. We aren't actually electing anybody to office. So since those 17 year olds will be eligible to vote in the general election, they can participate in the primary to narrow down the field of candidates. Um, and I think that's pretty neat. So primary election, who wins? I think the common thought in any election is whoever gets the most vote wins, votes wins. And a lot of times that is true, but in a primary election, candidates have to reach what's called a substantial plurality. And what that is, is 30% of the votes cast for that office need to be for the winning candidate for that person to be declared the nominee. If no candidate receives 30%, the candidate receiving the second highest votes has the right to request a second primary. So when you hear of a runoff election or a second primary, that's how we get to that point. No candidates for that office received 30% of the vote. Now, the second primary is not guaranteed. It's not an automatic process. That second highest vote getter candidate has to request it for there to be a second primary. Um, also important to note that candidates can be declared the nominee for the general election without going through a primary. So um, if we have the office of dog catcher and only one Democrat files for that office, that one Democrat does not need to go through the primary because they don't have any opposition from their party. So they are automatically declared the nominee to go on to the general election without having to go through the primary process. So when you see your ballot for the primary, you may not see names of people that you knew were running for election this year. And that, that's likely because they didn't have any other candidates in their party file for the office. So they were automatically determined to be the nominee and they were moved straight forward to the general election in November. Okay, so I talked about looking at your ballot and maybe you don't see candidates that you expected to see. Um, so how do you know what's on your ballot? The best way for any voter in North Carolina to know what's on their ballot is to look up their voter record prior to an election. We have a link on our main page. I've got a little snip of it up there. So on the Board of Elections page at the very top, there are four static links. One of those links directly to the state's voter lookup tool. Using the voter lookup tool, you'd put in your name and your county, likely, um, and you would find your record, you would click on it, and that serves so many purposes. One, it's going to confirm that you are registered to vote. You could check that you're registered at your current address, especially if you have moved. You might want to make sure that you're registered at your current address. You can see the party affiliation that you're registered with. Maybe you haven't registered in a long time and you're not really sure. You can see that on your voter record. And it will also show your election day polling place. So if you are not participating in absentee by mail or early voting, you need to know where your assigned polling place is for election day. The best way to know what that is, the current polling place for your precinct is to use the voter lookup tool and look up your record. Um, and then lastly, you will see your sample ballot. So a sample ballot will be available um, as soon as we get the ballots coded and approved, you can see that you can print it off, you can use it when you are researching candidates, you can mark the sample ballot, and you can even take it with you to vote to use as a reference for marking your official ballot at the polling place. I'm going to talk a little bit about registering to vote, and I just want to make sure everybody understands that the voter registration deadline for the primary election has passed. That was on April 22nd. 
Um, so registering to vote in the traditional fashion, it is too late for this election. Any forms we receive at this point, we will be holding on to and we will not process them until after the primary has passed. Um, so eligibility to register and vote. I think that most people know what these are, but I thought it was worth talking about. So US citizen, you have to be a US citizen to be eligible to register to vote. You have to live in the county where you're registering for at least 30 days prior to the date of the election. So that's 30 days prior to the election date, not the date that you're filling out the registration form. And you have to not be serving a sentence for felony conviction, including probation, parole, or post-release supervision. There have been some um, changes in the past uh, few months about the eligibility of felons to register and vote. So currently the rules are, if someone is on probation and parole, only because they have a monetary obligation to the court system, and they can think of no other reason that they would still be on probation or parole, they would be eligible to register and vote. But um, because it is such a serious offense, if, if somebody that's not eligible because of felony conviction registers and votes, I think that if there's a question about that, someone in the criminal justice system should probably speak to their probation or parole officer to be sure that they're doing the right thing. Um, what are the ways that someone can register to vote? Uh, online. Online through the DMV, if someone has a North Carolina driver's license, they can do a voter registration transaction through the DMV's website. Now that transaction is completely separate from updating your driver's license. So if I were to have changed, want to change my party affiliation prior to the deadline for this election, I could have gone through the DMV and used the information that they have on file for me to complete a registration. Um, I could print a voter registration form. So we do have print forms in our office. We can mail them to people. You can print it off from our website. Um, that is another way to register and vote is to complete a paper form and send it to our office. We do need the original for new registrations, but for any updates, those can be submitted electronically through fax or email. Or if you're an existing registered voter and you just need to make a change to your information in Brunswick County, you can update that on the voter registration card that we sent you when you registered to vote. And you could uh, indicate the changes, sign that card and mail it back to us. Um, the voter registration deadline is always going to be 25 days prior to the election. So um, in the November election, November 8th, 25 days before that, that's gonna be the cutoff date for registering to vote. But <laughs> when I say registration deadline, there is an exception to that. So someone who lives in Brunswick County and is otherwise eligible to vote, so not serving a felony sentence, um, has lived here for 30 days prior to the election, is a US citizen. They have the option to register and vote at the one stop early voting location. And, and they can register and then they can vote the very same day. So that is only available during early voting and that person participating in same day registration would need to provide proof of residency when they appear to vote. So that would be like a current utility bill that has the name and address. That could be um, a driver's license that has the current name and the current residential address. Um, Existing registered voters can update their name and address when they present to vote. So I think that's important to note. If you've had a name change and you haven't notified us yet and you show up to vote and your name on the rolls is your previous name, you can make that change right then and there when you present to vote. The only changes to existing registrations not allowed when you present to vote would be party affiliation changes. I'm going to touch quickly on some of the things that we do to keep the voter registration rolls clean. And all of those processes fall under the term list maintenance. So we are doing maintenance to keep our list of registered voters as up to date as possible. Um, we do this on an ongoing basis. So if you think about the work that the Board of Elections does um, all year long, voter registration and maintaining that list is the one thing that is a constant. We're doing it every day, we're doing it every month, all year long. We get monthly reports from the State Board of Elections that notify us of people that have died, people that have been convicted of a felony, people that may have a duplicate registration in another county in the state, and we also get cancellations from other states. And we get that information on a monthly basis, and we use that to look at our roles to see if there's anybody we can remove from the roles. 
Um, we also participate in the National Change of Address Program. And what that essentially is, when you move, you notify the Postal Service that you've changed your address. You tell the post office, when, when mail starts coming for me at this address, I need you to stop delivering it here and I need you to send it to this other address where I have moved. The National Change of Address program is taking all of that information from the Postal Service and giving it to the counties to allow us to contact those voters to try to get the address updated. So we do that twice a year. And what we're mailing to those voters is a confirmation card where we're asking the voter, do you live at this address we have on file or do you live at this address that you provided the Postal Service? The voter needs to do something with that card to indicate which address is correct and return it to us. If the card is not returned, that voter status is changed from active to inactive. And inactive is essentially a registered voter who would need to provide verification or update to their voter registration record prior to being allowed to vote. Um, and so that's twice a year. And then you see the biennial list maintenance. That is um, basically the big list maintenance process that you might hear about every two years when they talk about the Board of Elections purging the voter rolls. What that process is, it's a two-part process. The first part of it is a no contact mailing. So we compile data for any voter that has been registered to vote in Brunswick County for two federal general elections. So that would be four years. So we have a, a federal general election every two years in November. So we compile a list of the people that we have not had any contact with. So that could be um, registering to vote, requesting an absentee ballot, serving as a precinct official, signing a petition. Those are the kind of things that constitute official contact with the Board of Elections. So we mail a card to those people at the address on file. And that card is similar to the one with the change of address program where the voter needs to do something with that card and mail it back to us. If the voter does not ma mail that card back to us, their record becomes inactive. So again, the inactive voter is registered to vote, eligible to vote, but must update their information before they're, they're allowed to participate in an election. So that no contact mailing is the first part of that every two years. The second part of that every two years list maintenance is that we are able to remove any voter that has had an inactive status for two federal general elections. So if I were to move and my address isn't able to be verified and my record was changed to inactive today, and I did not participate in the 2022 election, and then I did not participate in the 2024 election, then in January of 2025, my record could be administratively removed from the rolls in Brunswick County. Um, and so those are some of the things that we do to maintain the rolls um, in Brunswick County. And these are uniform across North Carolina. I think that's important to note. So you have become registered to vote. What are your options for casting a ballot? So in North Carolina, you have three options. You can do absentee by mail, where we send a ballot to you. You can participate in one-stop early voting, which is what's going on now. And that's where counties have locations open throughout the county. And voters can go to any of those locations during any of the times that they're open and cast their ballot. Or you can go on election day. And I will just get into how each of those work. Absentee by mail is a process that gained popularity in 2020. So when we were getting into the 2020 general election, the pandemic was in full swing and people were not comfortable going to the polling places because those were likely going to be crowded. And a lot of people decided to take part in absentee by mail voting. Now, absentee by mail voting is different from state to state. So some states call it um, mail voting because they send absentee ballots to everyone. North Carolina is not in that category. So in North Carolina, any registered voter for any reason can vote by mail, but they have to officially request that. So step one is requesting your ballot. You have to use the most current North Carolina absentee request form, which can be found on our website, or you can make a request through the secure absentee portal. So those are the two ways to ask for a ballot, but you have to ask for the ballot. We are not automatically going to send you a ballot. The deadline to request a ballot for this election is going to be Tuesday, May 10th at five o'clock PM. And so your request has to be in the office by five o'clock PM on that date. Once you get your ballot, um, you are going to vote that ballot and you have to vote that ballot in the presence of two witnesses who are at least 18 years of age, 
or a notary public. Now the witness or the witnesses seeing you mark your ballot, they are not looking over your shoulder and seeing how you marked your ballot. They don't need to see what candidates you voted for. What they are doing is signing the envelope and saying that they saw you mark that ballot. So if, if it was called into question and we had to get into a hearing or something like that to see if that voter marked the ballot, the witness might be called to say, yes, I saw Sarah Levere mark that ballot and I did sign that envelope. So um, that's what the purpose of the witness is. Once you vote the ballot, you do return it to the Board of Elections. There are several ways to do that. You can mail it to us. Um, the envelope that you're returning the ballot is, we provide that. And on one side, it's already got our return address. And then the other, that is the application where the voter and the witnesses provide their information um, attesting to that ballot. So you can mail it, you can hand deliver it to any of the open early voting locations, or you can hand deliver it to the Board of Elections. The deadlines to return the ballot are election day. So if you're hand delivering it, it must be in our office by five o'clock p.m. on May 17th. If you are mailing it, it has to be postmarked by election day, which is Tuesday, May 17th, and received in the office three days later, which is Friday, May 20th. So if you're voting absentee and we're getting close to election day and you're going to mail it back, I highly suggest that you go into the post office and make sure that you get a postmark on that ballot. Because if we get the ballot after election day and it does not have a postmark on it, we cannot accept it. We can't approve that ballot. So that postmark becomes increasingly important as we get close to election day. Okay. One stop early voting. One stop early voting is essentially absentee voting, but you're doing it in person. So you can go to any of the five locations throughout the county during the hours that they are open. I have the locations listed. Um, we are open and I'm gonna skip this slide to the next schedule so you can see the full schedule. You can go to any of these loca locations at any of the times that they are open, regardless of whether where you live in the county. So if you are a resident of Shalote and you're headed to Wilmington to take care of some business, you can stop at the Leland early voting location. That's fine. Those locations have the ability to provide all of the ballot styles in the county to any voter that shows up. Um, we do have evening hours and weekend hours available, so I think this is very important as an alternative to voting on election day for people that may work all day on election day. Um, we always have a 17 day period. The law sets the times that we will be open, so the office hours at the cooperative extension location that's set by law. And the law states that if we have other locations, they will be open from 8 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. Monday through Friday. And so that's where we get the, the schedule. Uh, we always will have satellite locations in even year elections. So that is the locations that are not in Bolivia at the government complex. We also always try to at least have something in the Leland area, in the Southport area, in the Shalote area. Sometimes we expand beyond that, but those are the three areas that we like to be sure we have early voting. And last way to vote is election day. So that is what everybody thinks of when they think of elections is election day. For the primary, that is Tuesday, May 17th. On election day, voters must go to their assigned polling place. So when we looked at the voter lookup tool, that's gonna tell you where your election day polling place is. So the polls will be open from 6.30 a.m. until 7.30 p.m. Voters that are in line at 7.30 p.m. will be permitted to vote. And if you show up at the wrong location on election day, they do have the ability to look up what location you should be at. And so you have the option to be sent to the correct location, or you can stay at the location you ended up at and be offered a provisional ballot. And I'll talk about provisional voting in just a few minutes. Some of the things that are available when you vote in person, um, I'm gonna touch on just because I don't think that they are widely known. Um, curbside voting. So every polling place in North Carolina has curbside voting available. And what that is, it's voting from your car, essentially. So if you can get to the polling place, but because of age or physical disability, cannot get into the polling place independently, you can vote from your car. So if you get to the polling place, you will see signs that direct you where the curbside area is. 
Usually it's a couple of parking spots and each of those areas does have um, kind of a rope that when a car drives over it, it does alert the precinct officials that there's a curbside voter. We also have attendants that are monitoring the curbside area all day long to make sure if a voter comes, they receive the assistance they need. So voting curbside is very similar to voting in the polling place. You would provide your name and your address, um, your party affiliation. They would go inside and print your documentation and come out and you would vote the, vote the ballot essentially in your car. It's important to note that if you are driving someone to the polling place who's eligible to vote curbside, that does not automatically make you eligible to vote curbside. So to be able to cast a curbside ballot, you have to be able to sign the aff affidavit that says you're unable to enter the, the polling place. Um, and I think curbside voting also became pretty popular in 2020 because people that might have gone in otherwise, particularly during early voting, maybe they couldn't stand in the line. And so that prevented them from be, being able to go inside and vote and they could sign the affidavit that they could vote from their car. Um, voter assistance. Any voter who goes to the polling place is entitled to receive assistance with getting into the voting booth, marking their ballot. There are several different rules that you need to be aware of surrounding voter assistance though. So any voter can get assistance from a near relative. So if I go to the polling place and I go with my brother, I could get assistance from my brother because he's a near relative. I don't have to provide any other information. Um, a voter who, whose disability prevents him or her from entering the booth or marking the ballot without assistance or a voter who is illiterate can get help from any person. Now there is an exception to that, um, a voter's employer or union, somebody from those two organizations would not be permitted to assist a voter. So if I go in and I, um, I am visually impaired and I'm unable to mark the ballot, I can have somebody assist me with marking the ballot but they, and they do not have to be a near relative. It's also important to note that a poll worker can assist any voter. So if you go to the polls and you realize when you get there, you forgot your reading glasses, and so you can't read the ballot, you can ask one of the precinct officials there to assist you with marking that ballot if you're comfortable doing so. To receive the assistance, it is very important, a voter has to ask for assistance and they have to designate who they want the assistance from. So if I go in with my brother, I may not know that I'm supposed to say I want him to go with me and help me mark my ballot, but the precinct officials are trained to get that information from the voter. So they would ask questions to identify that I want assistance and who I want the assistance from. It's also important to note that the request for assistance does not have to be verbal. Not everyone is able to speak, so it can be done by writing and it can be done also by the precinct official asking questions of a voter. Um, and so those are some of the caveats for voter assistance. Again, precinct officials can help any voter if they think they need assistance with, with getting the assistance that they need. Um, provisional voting. Provisional voting has a bad rap, to be quite frank with you. A lot of people, when they hear provisional ballot, they think that is a waste of time. They think we do not consider them unless there's a close election. Um, sometimes people think provisional ballots are um, only counted for certain areas if an election is, is close, and none of that is true. Provisional ballots are essentially fail-safe voting for voters whose qualifications cannot be immediately verified in the polling place. So if I go into the polling place and I go to check in to vote and they don't see my name on the rolls, instead of turning me away and saying, I'm sorry, I don't see your name on the rolls, they offer me a provisional ballot so that they can research my eligibility. Have I submitted a voter registration form? Maybe I forgot to sign it. Maybe it's sitting in their queue at the office waiting on me to provide a signature. So the provisional ballot is offered to be sure that all eligible voters are able to vote in an election. Um, it's also important to know that the determination on whether a provisional ballot counts is not decided by the precinct official in the polling place. It's not decided by me as an employee of the Board of Elections. 
That decision is made by the bipartisan county board of elections at the Canvas meeting following an election. So the staff will do the research. We will look to see if we have any records of a person registering to vote. We will um, contact other counties or check with the DMV to see if there was a registration record. We do all of that research and present the findings to the board, but those board members are the ones that make the decision about whether those ballots get approved and counted or not approved. And election results are not finalized until all provisional ballots that are eligible to be counted are opened and added to the vote totals. So the results that we see on election night are not the final results because at that point we have not had a chance to review any of those provisional ballots. So that leads me into talking about the results of the election, when you see those and when they become official. Um, election results are always available on the website. You can go to this link and it will be available as we get closer to the election on our main page. There will be a link for election results. As soon as we get them and we get them ready to be released, they will show up on that website. So you can just refresh your browser to see if any new results have come out. The way the results are released um, is in stages. So election day, the polls close at 7.30 p.m. When the polls close, the first batch that gets released is everything from one stop early voting and the absentee by mail. So our board has already done the work to tabulate those and get those ready to be released. So as soon as the polls close, we're ready to hit go and those become available on the website. Throughout the evening on election night, the various locations, we have 27 polling places in Brunswick County, those results have to arrive in Bolivia for us to tabulate and release. And so you will see different batches of results coming out throughout election night. And that is because we have to wait for those to arrive at our office. Um, so at the end of the night, election night, you will see that all precincts have been reported and you will see results that are out there, but they are very clearly labeled unofficial and that's because the results election night are not the official election results. Um, and that's where we get into the canvas process. So starting the day after the election, we in the Board of Elections office start the canvas process. And what that is, is us making sure and double checking all of the numbers to make sure that the results we certify are correct. So we're doing audits. We're making sure that if a precinct had 100 voters check in, we have 100 ballots. And, and so everything's accounted for. We're doing provisional ballot research. So all of those voters that cast provisional ballots, we have to look into those and determine if there's evidence of registration or if there was an error or anything like that. We also have those supplemental absentee ballots that are coming in. If you recall, I said that absentee ballots had to be postmarked by election day, but could be received by that Friday. So we have those coming in and we have to add those to the totals. The election is final 10 days later on the date of Canvas, which this spring is going to be Friday, May 27th. So at 11 o'clock, the board will go into a Canvas meeting and that is where they finalize everything. So they will have added the absentee, supplemental absentees. They will have added the provisional ballots that were approved. And that is when the results become official. So if you're watching the news election night and you hear the news media calling the election or saying someone won, that is not something that is being done by the Board of Elections office. Our office would never call an election or finalize an election on election night because it's not possible. So those calls are being made by media and campaigns and people outside of the Board of Elections. Um, I do wanna talk about some election security concerns. We, as you can imagine, are getting more and more questions about this. And so I just wanna talk about some of the things we do and um, some of the things that you can do to help us fight mis misinformation and make sure that you know where to go to get the right information. Um, it's important to note that everything we do is in a bipartisan environment. When we review absentee ballots, when we are opening ballots and counting them, when we are going through the canvas process, all of that is done in a bipartisan environment. Our board members, as you recall, are bipartisan. We have representation from both parties. In the precinct, all of our precinct officials, party is taken into account when we place those in locations to make sure that we have a mix of Democrats and Republicans and, and we don't have a location that just has one. Everything is done in a bipartisan environment. Anytime we're doing 
anything with ballots as far as counting. Again, we are doing that under the supervision of the board. We do everything in public. Anytime our board is together and overseeing what we do, we are doing that as part of a public meeting. So members of the public can come to our meetings. We also live stream all of our board meetings. Um, leading up to this election, we live streamed our logic and accuracy testing. And what that is, is the testing that every piece of equipment that goes into the polling place that's going to tabulate results, we test it. We make sure the ballots are reading right. We make sure the results are being tabulated correctly. We double check that it can be released to the public and that the numbers are trans translating correctly. We're testing all of that. And then after we test it, we're sealing it. We're putting a security seal on it that has a number and we're logging that number. And those seals are not cut until it's ready to be used in the polling place. So um, election morning, there's a seal getting removed from every scanner that is accepting ballots that was put on as part of that logic and accuracy testing. Um, our voting system, it's air gapped, so it does not touch the internet. The computer in the office that we use to tabulate the results from each voting machine throughout the county, it is air gapped. It never touches the internet. It does not get connected to the network. Anytime we need to take information from the tabulation system and move it over to the public facing computer so that it can be released, we're using a brand new USB stick. So we're opening a package inserting it to get the data to move over to the public facing system. So we have that air gap so that those things never touch the internet and aren't vulnerable to um, cyber attack. We also have physical security. We have a vault in our building that holds all of the ballots. We have key cards that give employees access. Our building, you cannot get beyond our lobby without a, a member of our staff bringing you back. Um, where we keep the voting machines is behind another door with a key card access. I can see who has been in different parts of our building based on looking at the logs from the key card access. Um, and then we also do audits after the election. So I talked a little bit about the audits, um, looking at how many votes were cast and how many ballots we have. We also do a sample audit count after the election. The very next day, after the election, the State Board of Elections randomly selects two polling locations in each county, and those locations go through a hand eye count for the top contest on the ballot. So we will get those assignments and then we will assemble a bipartisan team and our board members for a public meeting where we will hand tally all of the ballots from that location and compare those results to the electronic results that were released. And those always match. So that tells us that the equipment released the right results because we went behind it and did a hand tally. And again, that is done under the um, supervision of the bipartisan board. And the last thing I wanna talk about is um, what you can do as a member of the public to help fight um, misinformation and disinformation. Um, disinformation is what happens when someone with bad intentions puts information out and it's not correct. So information about the election, maybe somebody decides they wanna say the election is May 18th and not May 17th and they put it out there with bad intentions. That's disinformation. It's when an unsuspecting person takes that bad information and shares it, that it becomes misinformation. And misinformation surrounding elections is rampant. People are taking information they hear about what happens in one state and thinking that it relates to North Carolina. People are um, seeing reports of things that happen and assuming that it happens here in Brunswick County or here in North Carolina. I think it's really important when you think about election processes to know where to go to get the right information. And the place that you should be going to get election information is me. It's our office. It's our website. It's our social media. We are the ones that know how elections work in Brunswick County. As, as I said, I've been doing this for a very long time. I've been here 16 years now. I know the mechanics of how elections work. If you think something is not right or have questions or read something or heard something, I can usually explain it to you, um, but you have to reach out and we have to be able to talk about it. What you're doing today is very important. You are becoming a prepared, educated participant in the elections process. You're trying to understand how it all works. Um, we need more people to do that because when you get the correct information from us, you can then correct misinformation as you see it, or share the right information or the right avenues to find information with people you know. 
Um, you should also think twice before sharing things online. I know that um, you've probably all heard this, but everything you read online is not true. So if you see a story on Facebook and it's got a flashy headline, you should probably read that story before you click the share button to make sure that the things in it are accurate. Um, so vet the things that you're sharing, don't just hit share. And lastly, I think that having qualified precinct officials is a way that we can ensure election integrity. So we, this election, have nearly 300 people that volunteer their time to work in the early voting sites and the election day location to make sure that the elections are run smoothly. We need intelligent people to do that. We need people to step up and, and take time out of their busy lives to participate as precinct officials to make sure that we have good elections. And um, it's just it's so important. And you also, when you're working in the precinct, you see how things are working. You know the things that we taught you as part of training. You see the safeguards that are going into place and the daily audits that the one-stop locations are doing and how we're counting the ballots and making sure they're all accounted for. So you can see that firsthand if you're working and serving as a precinct official. Um, if you're interested in learning more about serving as a precinct official, you'll see our website there. It's brunswickcountync.gov slash elections. We have a precinct official section there, and you can read about serving as a precinct official. It's important to note that I did say volunteer, so you are volunteering your time, but you do get paid. We do pay precinct officials um, pretty well, I think. So visit our website. You can also call us if you have any questions. You can send an email. Follow us on social media. Um, surrounding an election, we do try to put information and tidbits out on our social media, reminders, check your registration, how do you find your sample ballot, things like that. So see those posts and, and do the things that they're teaching you to do, like check your registration, share those posts, make sure people know what they should be doing um, to get ready for every election. Um, with that said, I am, I have finished my presentation. I don't see any questions in the Q&A box. I will leave it open for just another minute or two. So if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A box, or you can send an email. Um, our email is elections at brunswickcountync.gov. All of those emails come to me, so I do review those. So if you have questions, you're welcome to send them there.